السلام عليكم should change to Maghrib? I'll forget. Okay. <clears throat> we, inshallah, this week, of course, we'll do tafsir now. Uh, but starting from next week, inshallah, we'll have it after Maghrib, as the time is getting later. I don't think it'll get later this, but anyway, 9 o'clock is a bit of a late time, so from next week, inshallah, we'll have it after Maghrib. Inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب المبين My dear respected elders and brothers as we finished off the Surah Hud last week or the week before, <clears throat> being last week, the spring vacation was there, so we figured we'd start to the use of this week, being that many people probably were not, uh, or many people on vacation and things like this. So this week we start uh, one of the great surahs of Quran, in popularity, of course. All the surahs are great, uh, but one great, Allah Ta'ala Himself will do the ayat also, uh, calls it the best of all stories, and that is Surah to Yusuf. <clears throat> this surah is Makiya. It is... Uh, a Makki surah, meaning before the Hijrah, this uh, surah was revealed. And like many of the other uh, surahs of the Quran, Allah Ta'ala starts with the Hurufi Muqatta'at, which is a sign of the Ijaz, the miracle of the Quran. Ulama have said that the tafsir of this is only known to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the indications that Mufassirin have given towards the meaning of it. Uh, uh, or we can say the meaning that indicates towards its ijaz, towards it being a miracle, is that, O oh, Ahlu Arab, O oh, Arab, O oh, people of Mecca, you are eloquent and can speak the Arabic language in a very high level. So therefore, you come up with these type of haruf like Allah Ta'ala has, if you can challenge the Qur'an. And obviously they could not. These were very... Uh, you know, original words and words that the Arab had never heard, and so beautiful also. Alif lam ra, alif lam mim, kaf ha ya ain sin qaf. All these beautiful hurufi muqattaat where it starts off with, Allah Taala knows only what the meaning is, and of course this is um, nothing to be shy or nothing to be uh, doubtful about that we don't know the meaning of this. Some Mufassideen have written that is indication towards us that the Qari'ul Qur'an, the person who reads the Qur'an, first of all he should make iqrar, he should first attest and he should admit to his jahalat, to his ignorance, before he starts learning what the Qur'an is. So Allah Ta'ala starts off with one, you know, a couple of words and letters that he never will able, be able to know the meaning of. So this shows the jahalat and the ignorance of man. Uh, it's also an indication uh, of the itaat, of the obedience that we have to have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Qur'an, how we start off, we start off not knowing. But even though we don't know, we will still carry on blindly and read the other ayat and learn their meanings, even though we don't know the meaning of huruf muqatta'at. One of our teachers, Qari Yunus, who taught us uh, one, 10 ajizaya Qur'an, and it was uh, Surah Yusuf was one of them, he used to say that us not knowing the meaning of it, it's not a big deal. We don't have to know the meaning of it. He said this as if I told you that tomorrow I will not come to class. Tomorrow I will not come to class. So the reason why I'm not coming to class for the student, it doesn't need to be known. All he has to know is that the Ustad is not coming. Why he's not coming, that's none of your business. In the same way Allah Ta'ala has revealed this Alif Lam Ra. What is the meaning of it? Doesn't matter. Allah Ta'ala has revealed it. It's an ayat of Quran. So there's no really loss of us not knowing it. Inshallah in the Akhirat we will know the meaning of these. And there was amongst the Sahaba and the great Mufassireen and Fuqaha who say that of course these ayat, of Quran, these Hurufi uh, Muqatta'at, you can actually express some meanings of them 
Ibn Abbas who of course was one of the great Mufassireen of the Sahaba, the greatest Hibl Ummah, Ra'isul Mufassireen. His view also was that uh, the huruf i some meanings can be given to them. But really it just all comes down to the same thing. Even those meanings that were given by the Sahaba anhum, about the huruf i about these Alif Lam Ra and Alif Lam Meem, at the end of the day, nobody could ever say that that was the actual meaning of it. It was just an idea or something they had said that it could be the meaning of this. So at the end of the day, uh, 100% we don't know uh, what the tafsir of these, uh, of these are. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very beautifully, Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin These are the ayat, these are the signs, the sentences of a book which is very clear. Mubin. Yani bayin. It is a very clear book. Clear in its ahkam, in its laws. It's clear in its qisas, the stories that are given. And it's clear in its amthila, the mithal, the examples that are given, the similes that are given in Quran, they are all in great clarity. In the Arabic language, in order to indicate towards something, we use something that we call a small ishara. For example, if I want to say this book right in front of me, I will say hadha kitab. This is a book, or this book. And if I want to say that, we have this, and we have that in the language, so that would be for something that is something far away. That man over there, you don't say that man, and he's right in front of you. That man over there. So we use the word dhalika, and in the, in the female tense, we use tilka. So ayat, this word is a mu'annis. It is a female word in the Arabic language. And tilka, it is a ishara. It is a indicating, a word that indicates. This is the ayat. This is the sentences. These are the signs of the book. So tilka is actually used for something far. It should be actually hadhi ayat. Hadhi ayat. That's the, the tarjima and the... And the translation I've given is actually for hadhi ayat. We are compelled to make it because that, you know, those ayat, it's a little bit weird, the translation. But in the Arabic language, the reason why this is done, it shows the vastness of the Quran. How vast it is, how great. It's so great and so large and so big that with ism ishara, with something that right in front of you, you can't indicate towards it. You have to indicate it like it's something that is far away and vast. It's for respect almost also. In the Urdu language, you get it also, right? If you're speaking about someone who is older, you won't say karta hai, right? You say karte hai, right? That hai, that is for, in Arabic language also, assalamu alaikum. One guy in front of you, he's not even that fat also, not a big guy, you have to say, he's many people, assalamu alaikum. But in Arabic, it's assalamu alaikum for respect and honor. That he is, you know, a respectful person. He's a Muslim. He's a person with iman. So therefore, we speak to him in a plural tense. In the Urdu language also, that karte hain. That hain, that is for, you know, respect and honor. An older person, if you don't do it, in the Urdu, they say, it's like, chapa, right? like you smack him in the face. It's a disrespect. It's a disrespect. So, in the Arabic language, you get these type of things also. In English, English is, uh, our dads who didn't like English, you know. They used to say that, yeah, but be adab. It's a, it's, a, it's a very disrespectful language. There's nothing like this where high and low and this, that. You know, they say, one of my ustads who spoke the Urdu language and Arabic also, he used to say swear. Swear is also you promise, swear to Allah, and you swear to someone also, you curse him. Same word, swearing and swearing. Cursing and, you know, promising is the same word, swear. So they used to say that this language has no respect. And we do lack respect in the English. Spanish language also has it. Usted and all these things you say for respect. English lacks in it. We don't have that, uh, those different tenses for respect. But anyway, for the respect and honor and the vastness of the Quran, Allah Ta'ala has said tilka. Meaning that, uh, you know, ishara ba'id, something that is far away, but not far away from us, but it's so vast that we have to indicate towards it as it's far away from us. So these are the ayat of the book, these are the signs of the book, which is very clear. After this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Verily, we have revealed this Qur'an. Who going back to Qur'an? We have revealed the Qur'an 
uh, we have revealed it, who going back to Quran, and how we revealed it, what condition have we revealed it? It's Quran, and it's something which is read. It is a Quran which is recited. Arabian, and it is in the Arabic language. Allah has chosen the Arabic language because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was sent on him. He was Arab, his people were Arab also, and the Arabic language, if we study it, and we look at it, and we see it, we will realize that it is the best language of all languages. The best language of all languages. So Allah says, uh, Quran and Arabia, we have revealed it in the Arabic language uh, for the mere reason of what? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So that you may understand. O oh, Arab, that Rasulullah may understand it. And the Sahaba and the Mushrik in Mecca, they may understand it. If it was in another language, then they would have had the barrier of language in front of them, like we have today. But Alhamdulillah, the Arabic language is such that anybody can learn it. Anybody can learn it. If we look at other languages, they usually are very difficult to recite, difficult to pronounce. And many languages, the rules that they have are according to exception of the rule. Even the English language, one of the hardest languages to learn is the English language. Why? The rule goes to the exception. The rule is this, and they are exception, exceptional cases, and the exceptional cases usually are what happens. <laughs> but in the Arabic language, is not like that. The rule is like this. And they are one to exceptional cases, okay? But the rule usually is what stands. So anybody can learn the Arabic language. Uh, it's not something that's very difficult and hard. And I know, mashallah, the brothers are making effort here too, right? And after Fajr, they are learning the Arabic language. So these type of ayat should be a driving force for us to learn it. That we're learning the Arabic language uh, in order for us to learn, you know, the Qur'an. It's not just to learn a language that we can understand when the, you know, when the Al Jazeera is talking, we can understand what Al Jazeera is saying. And understand that and read the Arabic newspapers. No, no, not for that reason. We learn the Arabic language because it is a tool for us to learn the Quran, it is a means for us to learn the Quran. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets into the best of all stories. بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Allah Ta'ala says that نَحْنُ نَكُسُّ عَلَيْكَ We are relating the story to you. أحسن القصص The best of all stories. أحسن القصص the word Ahsan in the Arabic language, we call this Ism Tawdil, which means the best. Hassan is good and beautiful, but Ahsan is the best and the most beautiful and the most greatest story. The reason why it has been called the greatest of all stories, ulama have uh, tafsir have, have said different reasons why. The first reason is that it is the rise and fall of a person. Meaning Yusuf alayhi salam was in such a bad condition where he was the, in the bottom of a well. And a young boy also helpless. And Allah Ta'ala took him from the bottom of a well to the throne of Egypt. So that's why it's the greatest of stories. It shows how a person fell so low that he was helpless, that he could not get out of a bottom of a well. And Allah Ta'ala took him to the kingdom of Misr, which was the greatest and highest place to be at that time. Allah Ta'ala, also, the Mufassin have also mentioned that any, a simple person, how a simple person could be leading the sophisticated people. This also is one of the reasons why it's Ahsan al Qasas. That this simple person, Yusuf alayhi salam, the son of a Nabi Ya'qub, living in Syria, Kanaan, a very simple place. Now he's taken from there and he goes to the glamour of Misr and Egypt where there's only gold and the Euphrates and the, the river is there, Euphrates River and the, you know, the, the, the Egyptian governments and the pyramid and all those different things are there, a totally different life. And this simple person comes and he leads these sophisticated people and he becomes a leader of them. Uh, some ulama say that it is a great story, the greatest of all story, why? It is the story of a father who found his son, which is always a story that people want to hear about, right? A father loses his son and then he finds him. Usually, na'udhu billah, may Allah ta'ala protect us. And we know we see in the news already when these little kids, they go missing. Many a time, they find them somewhere and something happens, na'udhu billah. So, such a great story that after so many years, a person's, 
you know, and Yaqub alayhi salam's love that he had for him, we did also, was so great that, you know, we never hear about this from anybody else. But in this Quran, it says that Yaqub alayhi salam cried and wept so much that he became blind because of the loss of his son. He loved him so much. And Allah Ta'ala to take him away. And then after so many years, not only to give him back, but to get him back in the condition that he is now a king, the king of Misr, successful also. We'll get more into it inshallah. So some of the ulama mentioned that the reason why is because it's a great story of a father finding his son after he was lost. And the last one the ulama mentioned is that because this story proved the nabuwat of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa it proved the prophethood of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will know from the Shani Nuzul, from the reason why the ayat came, where it's coming up, لَقَدَ كَانَ فِي يُوسَفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتُ لِلسَّائِلِينَ That the reason why this surah was revealed was because of two reasons the Mufassirin mentioned, both are basically close to the same, that the Yahud of Medina, those who were the Jewish people of Medina, because in Mecca there were no Jews, so the Jews of Medina had found out that Rasulullah's Nabuwat had started and his prophethood had started in Mecca. So they sent a group of Jewish scholars to him and they went and asked him that one young boy fell into a well, he lived in Syria, then he was taken to Misr, away from his father, then he was returned back to his father. Who is this person? On this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah. They didn't even mention Yusuf or any, they just mentioned some features and some parts of the story. And right away, Allah ta'ala sent the surah Yusuf. And not only sent the surah Yusuf, but aspects of the story that even the Yahud didn't have in their books. They were in confusion about it. They didn't even know. The Torah was not so clear about it. After Rasulullah had, uh, had recited this surah upon them, then they realized the clarity and they understood what the story of Yusuf was even more clearer. And some ulama even mentioned that it wasn't actually the Jews, but it was the mushrik in Mecca that went to Medina and started asking the Jews that we have this person Muhammad and he's claiming to be a prophet like the prophets of the past. What should we do with him? So the Jews asked, told him that you go and ask him that Musa alayhi salam was in Misr. And before him, all the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam was in Sham and Syria and Canaan. How did Nabuwa jump from Syria all the way to, you know, to, to Egypt? Where, where, did that, where did that jump come from? It's almost like a gap in history when the board was in Syria and now it all jumped to Misr. So how did that happen? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Surah Yusuf down that this is how it happened. Yes, the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam was in Syria and in Sham in a place called Canaan. But because Yusuf alayhi salam was taken from the well and the caravan brought him to Misr, now that Nabuwat was transferred now to Misr and that's how the progeny of Nabuwat started now coming out in Misr in Egypt. So some ulama say that Ahsan al-Qasas, the reason for it was because it was uh, a proof of the Nabuwat and the prophethood of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And such a great proof it was because at that time in Mecca Mukarramah, there were no Jews around, they were in Medina. And there was no way that in such detail, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have known this story. There was no way. Once he revealed this story, the Yahud, the Mushrik in Mecca, everybody knew, even though they didn't accept, that this person was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bima awhayna ilayka hadha al-Qur'an. Ah, through what we have revealed to you, this Qur'an. Meaning this Ahsan al-Qasas is not coming to you by any dream or anything, but it's coming you to, through wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala is revealing it to you in this Qur'an. وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Pointing to the fact that I just said that even though before this you were from those people who did not know about it. Where did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam? Mufassirin have mentioned that Ibrahim alayhi salam and many of the stories that came after him they knew about it. The mushrik in Mecca understood they had Kaaba there and they knew that Ibrahim alayhi salam was a prophet and what happened to him but there was a total ignorance about Yusuf alayhi The mushrik in Mecca did not know who Yusuf alayhi was, what story, they had no clue what it was. This was the first time they were hearing it and the Yahud also knew that this was you know, an exact 
you know, replica of what was in the Torah, and even more clear than the Torah also, uh, clearing up many confusions the Torah had also in it. وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنْ غَافِلِينَ Even though Nabi Sallallahu you are unmindful of this story, and you didn't know about this story, still we will reveal it to you, and you will, uh, you know, recite it to the people with such, you know, precision, and such, mashallah, minute and, and precise information, that inshallah the people will know that you are Nabi of Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala then starts the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِ إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ رَأَيْتُهُمْ لِي سَاجِدِينَ Allah Ta'ala says, Remember إِذْ يَنِي أُذْكُرْ إِذْ Remember when Yusuf alayhi salam said to his father, and we already know his father was Yaqub alayhi salam, who was the grandson of Ishaq, was the, was the, he was the grandson of Ishaq. Ishaq was the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Yaqub was the son of Ishaq, and now Yusuf was the son of Yaqub. So this is the great grandson of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It called a Yusuf ali Abi. When he said to his father Yaqub, Ya Abati, uh, with, which, with such beautiful uh, you know, sayings and it's a sign for our youth also and also the elders as well, our fathers, many of our fathers are still alive, that we should always address our father not by his name. He didn't say Ya Yaqub, oh Yaqub, right? Like in America, the kids, they, Henry, hey Henry, his father's name is Henry, hey Henry, hey Henry, hey Bob, come here, right? Hey Bob, buy me this Bob. Right? So you should never call your father by his regular name. Even in front of people, some lakab, some nickname should be given to him. And dad, ab, abba, baba, whatever it may be, uh, choo choo chi chi, whatever your language says, you can call him that, but it should be something that is known as respectful. So, ya abati, oh my father. And actually was ya abi, ya abi, but the ta is put here for love and mahabbat, for shafqa, ya abati. Inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaba. Verily, I saw 11 stars. Kawkab. Kawkab, this means a star. And ahada ashara, ahada is one, and ashara is ten. This is the way we say in the Arabic language, numbers, which means 11. So I saw 11 stars, was shamsa, and the sun, wal qamara, and the moon, ra'aytuhum li sajideen. I saw them prostrating in front of me. Now here, he mentioned Ra'aytu and he mentioned Ra'aytuhum again. In Arabic we call this taqeed. This is for emphasis. And many mufassineen, those who deal with the meaning of the Qur'an, they say Allah Ta'ala said this in the way like a child speaks. You know when children speak to you and they repeat themselves. Can I go to, I want to go to the store, I want to go to the store. They'll repeat themselves and they'll say things twice, three times. So in the same way like a child did, he said, Inni ra'aytu ahada. I saw, you know, 11 stars and the sun and the moon. And I saw them. Like this he was saying it. So he says, I saw them and they were prostrating to me. So this was a dream that, you, that uh, Yusuf Islam saw, which he related to his father. Uh, after relating this dream to his father, his father became very worried for Yusuf Islam. Not only worried, but he became happy as well. Because this dream, as we know, Yaqub was a prophet, it was a sign of nubuwat, a special dream for young Yusuf. It was actually a basharat and a glad tiding that he was going to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that the dreams, they are actually wahi. They are actually the, uh, the revelation when it comes to anbiya. We'll speak more about it in the next ayat. Then Allah ta'ala says, قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تَقْصُصْ رُؤْيَاكَ عَلَىٰ إِخْوَتِكَ فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لِلْإِنسَانِ عَدُوٌ مُّبِينٌ قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ And Ya'qub alayhi salam replied to his son, O oh my beautiful son, لَا تَقْصُصْ رُؤْيَاكَ عَلَىٰ إِخْوَتِكَ do not tell or do not relate your dream to your brothers. Do not relate your dream to your brothers. 
فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدَ They will devise a plan against you. They will plot against you if they find out about this. He already knew that this was a sign of Nabuwat and his brothers, Ya'qub alayhi salam, as he was the father, he realized and knew already that his brothers had some type of enmity towards him. What was that enmity? Why was that enmity? Basically, there was 11 brothers uh, who Yusuf alayhi salam had. These were his half-brothers. The mother of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam, her name was Rahil binti Laban. She was, her name was Rahil, and she was the daughter of Laban. And she married Yaqub alayhi salam. After her sister, and her sister's name was Leia. And Leia, she was the mother of these first 11 children. She passed away. When she died, then Rahil, her sister, her younger sister, realizing, and it happens many times, it usually does not happen in our communities, because there's a lot of takalluf in our communities. We have a lot of, we don't like people looking at us. So for a sister to marry, you know, the, the man who her sister was married to after she passes away, uh, many in our communities, we don't like these type of things. TK, it's in its own place. But uh, those communities that don't have takalluf, sahaba radiallahu anhum, uh, the MBA, they found nothing wrong with this and they found it appropriate. Why? Because who would take better you know, care for the children than, than her own sister? Well, after she passed away, her sister would take care of the children. She'll treat them as, as much as she can, like her own. So after uh, the Leia passed away, then uh, Ya'qub alayhi salam married Rahil. And Rahil, she gave two children to Ya'qub alayhi salam. One was Yusuf alayhi salam and one was bin Yamin. In English we say Benjamin. So these two children, they were younger and also they were Ya'qub's new children. They were his, you know, his young ones. The young ones always get a little bit more affection and the older ones sometimes they are a little bit jealous of them. So the jealousy of these brothers, it was very strong. First of all, they were half-brothers, which you get that naturally, where half-brothers have some type of enmity. You're not, a part of the, you're not a real part of the family. You are intruders, whatever it may be. So they had that also. And also, even though these 11, they were the sons of a prophet, but unfortunately, they were not gifted with Nabuat. They did not become Ambiya which was something that was understood from the progeny before. If your father was a Nabi, then chances are you're going to be a Nabi also. But they were not blessed with Nabuat. Some of us even have said that they were, uh, they were an Anbiya of Allah Ta'ala. But most of the Mufassirin say that no, that can't be true. Because look at the things that they did to Yusuf alayhi salam. This is not the shan and the style of the Anbiya. It doesn't look like they were Anbiya of Allah Ta'ala, prophets of Allah Ta'ala. So the second reason why they had jealousy was that they knew that Yusuf salam probably was going to be an Nabi of Allah Ta'ala. The beauty that Allah Ta'ala gave him. Right away he was, and Allah Ta'ala, the Anbiya, mostly all of the Anbiya, they were beautiful in their, 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 their khilqat. Allah Ta'ala created them so beautiful also. That's why uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith of Bukhari, where he met Yusuf salam on the fourth level of Mi'raj, and he met him, he mentions in that Hadith, that when I saw Yusuf alayhi salam, I saw that the beauty that Allah Ta'ala bestowed him was half of the beauty of the whole creation. He was so beautiful that half of the beauty of the creation was given to him and the other half was dispersed and, and made taqseem amongst the rest of the, you know, the, of the makhluk of Allah Ta'ala. But half of the beauty that Allah Ta'ala created in creation was given to Yusuf alayhi salam. Such a beautiful young boy. So you can see when someone is special and talented, and young, you know, we know in America, you know, when the, the NBA players, you know, when the little kids, you already know they're going to be something, you know. A little, little kid and he's already jumping up and he's already five foot three and he's four years old. So, you know already, this kid's going to be something special. Football player, he's already coming in. He's only 10 years old and he's 280 pounds. This guy's going to be a linebacker. He's going to be something. So, you know, the Nabuat, what about that? You can already see this guy's going to be Yusuf. This is, good. This is the Nabi of Allah Ta'ala. So they had this type of jealousy for him also. So that's why he said, Ya Bunaya, la taqsusuriyak. Don't tell your dream to your brothers. If you tell them, they're going to want to get rid of you. They're going to be so jealous of you, they're already jealous of you, that you have become a prophet of Allah Ta'ala. I'm very scared. And he understood his sons and the dangers that were lurking in their hearts. So la taqsusuriyak. Do not tell them your dream. Uh, 
فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا They will plot against you. Now, a little bit about dreams, ru'yaka. Because a lot of times we, you know, we like to know about dreams and everybody wants to know about their dreams and, and uh, we've become people who we have an interpretation book right on our nightstand, right? And we know, one, you know, one night, mashallah, we're going Jannah, the next night we're right with Abu Jahl, right next to him in Jahannam. We don't even, wow, oh my God. One night it's, I'm with the angels, the next night, astaghfirullah, what did I see? And na'udhu billah. So in Islam, what are dreams? Uh, good for us to understand because uh, this whole th- story is based first on a dream. So in the hadith of Muslim, Rasulullah has mentioned there's three types of dreams. Three types. One dream is hadith nafs Meaning, you stayed up at night, you saw a zombie movie, so you dreamed that zombies were eating you. It's the last thing you saw. Right? You ate too much pasta at 12 o'clock at night. You, eat, you ate too much, your stomach was full. So, Yunusab in South Africa who passed away in Mecca Mukarramah, he would finish his umrah, pray two rakats, and he died right there at Kaaba, right in front of Kaaba. And we met, visited his uh, grave, is there in Janatul Baqi. So, uh, he used to say, when people used to come to him and say, I had this dream, that dream, he used to say, Abdul Ziyadah Kaya, you ate too much the night before. You ate too much biryani the night before. Maybe you went to some nikah, something, you ate too much. So we eat things, we see things. Hadith nafs. Then when we close our eyes, we see that, uh, you know, at the night. So those dreams usually have no type of sustenance, no type of meaning in them. Right? Another type of dream is uh, what we call taswilu shaitan, hulum, ahlam. Well, the shaitan now uh, influences us in our dreams and he shows us different things. So this, these dreams what we call bad dreams, right? You may see yourself killing someone, uh, billah, you see yourself in a bad condition, you see very disgusting things, things like this. Uh, so these type of dreams, uh, the hadith have mentioned, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned that these type of dreams we should not relate to anybody else. That's the first thing. When we see a bad dream, so the first thing we should do at night time, in the middle of the night, you wake up from a sweat, you saw a bad dream. So the first thing we should do, we should spit on our left side. Now don't hug a loogie. You don't start now bringing up the phlegm. You just, you know, with the on the, on the left side uh, three times, and you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. And then after that, as a nake fali, as a good omen, you turn your, to the other side. So to say, you want to turn your condition also. That the condition was bad dream, now I turn myself to another condition, hopefully a good dream will come. Right? And so that's the first thing, we ask protection from it. And the second thing, we should not relate that dream. In a hadith it comes, hadith of Muslim and Bukhari, very strong a hadith, that if the person relates it, then it could cause that person some harm. That dream could harm a person. So when we see bad dreams, we should not worry, that's what we should do. Ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us. So these are the dreams of shaitan which should not be worried about. We just do that and that's the antidote Allah, Rasulullah has given us. And the last one is what we call mubashirat. Any glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, which usually happens in a hadith it comes, أَسْتَقُ الرُّؤْيَ بِالْأَصْحَارِ Meaning the time right before Fajr, you pray tahajjud, you fell off back to sleep, your intention is to go to the masjid Fajr. Right in between there, what a pious time, what a great time to sleep. There is where a person usually sees great dreams. He went to sleep with the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. His wudu is there. His intention is so good to go. You see the good dream. Mubashirat. Good dreams. About this, Rasulullah used to recommend to the sahaba to relate these dreams. Rasulullah after fajr, his ma'mul and his practice was after fajr, after his adhkar, he would sit and he would ask the sahaba who had some good dream last night. Tell it to me. Let me hear these dreams. And he would relate and interpret these dreams to them. So that's why in the hadith it comes, the hadith of Bukhari also is there, where Rasulullah has said that take the good from the good dreams, meaning consider it as glad tidings. And don't tell it to anyone except those people who like you. Meaning when you have a very good dream and you come in front of someone who doesn't have a good thought about you. Right? Whenever we make mashura or we ask someone for some advice, that person should have two qualities. Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi has mentioned this in his books, that if you have a mushir, a person you want to consult with, I've got some problems, I want to talk to him, he should have two qualities. If you don't have these two qualities, don't talk to him. Inni lakum nasihun ameen. 
He should be a well-wisher of you. He should be someone who wants good for you. That this person should be good. And also, I mean, he should be, have amanat. He should have, he should be trustworthy. That now you tell him, listen, I've got some, you know, pimple growing under my arm. Make dua for me. Now it's in next, you know, it's in YouTube, right? Pimple under the arm. Mikhail, right? So, you know, I don't want people to know about that. I've got this problem, that problem, and now they, everybody knows about it. Next, you know, everyone's looking at you, and Chun Chu's going, come to the masjid. <laughs> What's going on here? Everybody knows. Right? He's not a mean. He's not trustworthy. He told your, your secret to everybody. So make sure whenever we discuss something to someone, he's a well-wisher, he wants good for you, and also a mean. If they have these two qualities, then mashallah, you can make the mashura with him. So this is just a little bit about the dreams uh, which Allah, which Rasulullah has mentioned. Here, of course, this will of course be amongst those dreams that are mubashirat. The good dreams. The sahaba, they used to have the good dreams. And even uh, the ulama have mentioned if a person related a bad dream to a person, it still would not be a sin. Because the ulama mentioned that Rasulullah related his bad dream to the Sahaba. He once had a bad dream and he, met, and he saw that uh, a lot of cows and animals were being sacrificed the day before Uhud. And about 70 of them. And this signified Hamza radiallahu anhu and the Sahaba, which was something that was bad that happened. So ulama have mentioned that we shouldn't relate bad dreams, but if a person did it, it would not be sinful. Because Rasulullah did it himself to Sahaba and told them of a bad dream. Anyway, so uh, Yaqub alayhi salam told him, don't tell your brothers about the dream. And then he mentioned, of course, the reason and the element why you know, your brothers can now do a kaid and do some type of plot in, against you. Inna shaytan al-insani It's not just your brothers, but this shaytan, he is an open enemy to you. Shaitan's adawat and his enmity to us, it's nothing secret. Right? Basically, Shaitan, this is his work. He just wants to get one group, one jamaat tayar, right? We get the jamaat tayar. Ek jamaat tayar. He wants to get one jamaat ready to go where? No 40 days, no four months. He doesn't want you to go to the next mahola and give dawah straight to Jahannam. Ashab Sa'id. I'm going there, you must go there with me. Like the druggie, right? The person who's a drug. He doesn't care, but just you must do the drugs with me. I need someone to sit here with me and be bad like me. So this is shaitan. He just calls his group and keeps on. Come, come. Where are we going? We're going to Jahannam. That's what I want you to go to. You must go with me. So Adubun He's a very clear enemy. So this shaitan, he's going to get hamla and he's going to overtake your brothers and they're going to do something bad. May Allah Ta'ala protect us from shaitan. Allah Ta'ala then mentions after this, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبَ كَمَا كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقَ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ So now Yaqub shows the happiness and gives the glad tidings to what this dream is actually telling us, O oh my son Yusuf. وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ in this way, O oh my son Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah Ta'ala has chosen you. Allah Ta'ala has chosen you. This is the way Allah Ta'ala does it. He gave you this dream and now you're going to be a Nabi of Allah Ta'ala. Ulama have mentioned here that when a person, when a father hears something good from his son, he should be happy about it. When, something, when, his, bro, when his son achieves something, he should be happy about it. Yaqub alayhi salam didn't tell him, Oh, we get out of here. There's nothing, you stupid dream. You don't know nothing. He told him, Allah Ta'ala has chosen you now. So in the same way, uh, when our children or our sons come to us with some type of good news, uh, the fathers, they should be happy about this. Uh, There's a story that our ulama have written of one person in the army who was of high rank, but his son became even more high rank. Son became like a general, something like this. So whenever people used to come, the general, they would you know, salute. But this person, when his son would come in, and his son was a higher rank than him, he would make sure, with a lot of you know, emphasis, that he would, <clears throat> and he would go right in front and do like this. So somebody asked him, your son, man, 
even if you didn't do it, he's not going to, you're, you're your son. So why are you always saluting him so strongly like this? So he said, I love it. I get happy when I see that my son has become successful. I feel obliged that I must, you know, salute him even better than you because this is my son. I'm happy for him. Right? In the same way, it's mentioned of Ma'at Tariq Jamil, where one time he was giving, we all know Ma'at Tariq Jamil, a great Mubay and a person who gives great bayans. When he was giving one bayan, and in the majma, in the group, in the people who were listening to him, was one of his ustads, his teachers. And one of his, you know, in the preliminary years, in the beginning years, one of his teachers. So, after the bayan, some people knew that he was the ustad. So one person came to his ustad and told him that, wow, this Ma'at Tariq Jamil has become very great. How do you feel that, you know, you're sitting here, nobody knows you, and your student is there, and he's become so, you know, incredible, and everybody's so popular. So the Ustad said, Ajib thing, very strange, beautiful thing. He said, not only Ma'atara Jamil, but my khayish and my desire is that every single one of my students becomes like that. I want that every single one of my students become a great person like this, greater than me. I want them to become better than me. He's going to get the reward anyway. So, mashallah, might as well get there without any work. <coughs> so Allah Ta'ala says, in this way Allah Ta'ala has chosen you. Rabbuk, wa yu'allimuka min ta'weel ila hadith. And because it started off with this beautiful dream, Allah Ta'ala will teach you the interpretations of dreams. Yusuf alayhi salam, one of the great miracles of Yusuf alayhi salam, and we'll see it later on with his story, is that he used to be able to interpret dreams. So Allah Ta'ala blessed him with this miracle. Wa yutimmu ni'matahu alayka. And he will complete his blessing upon you. The ulama mentioned the completing of the blessing of Yusuf salam is giving him nubuwwat, making him a nabi and a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah ta'ala says, Wa ala ali Yaqub and the family of Yaqub, many people after you, Suleiman, Da'ud alayhi salam, many after you will become uh, prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Kama atammaha ala abawaik. The same way. That Allah Ta'ala completed his ni'mah, meaning gave nabuwat, gave prophethood to your parents before you. And who were they? Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ishaq. They were prophets. I'm a prophet, Yaqub. Yusuf, you will be a prophet. Your children also will be prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a great basharat and what a great glad tiding this dream held. Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. And very Allah Ta'ala, He is the knower. He knows exactly who to give Nabuwa to. And Hakim, it's Hikmat. His wisdom is such that He will give Nabuwa to the right person. After this, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and we'll end off in this last ayat, Allah Ta'ala mentions, لَقَدَ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتٌ لِلسَّائِلِينَ we already discussed this. Allah Ta'ala mentions, لَقَدَ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفِ That in Yusuf alayhi salam, وَإِخْوَتِهِ And in his brothers, there's a great sign for those people who are asking. And I already told you who was asking. It was the Yahud of Medina who came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked about what is the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Or it could be the Mushrik in Mecca who took the advice of the Yahud to ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that how did Nabuwat and prophethood transfer from Syria, Kanaan and Sham all the way to Misr without any type of indication how did this happen they are the sa'ileen they are the people who are asking so Allah Ta'ala says here لَقَدْ أَكَانَ فِي Yusuf that verily in Yusuf alayhi salam and in his brothers there are great signs for those who are asking, for the Yahud who are asking, there's a great sign. What is that sign? Many signs we will see in this. One of the signs amongst them is that this person who you're asking, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is a prophet of Allah ta'ala, or else he would have never known these things. Inshallah, we'll carry on next week with the rest of the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. Wa akhudawan, alhamdulillah. Just to remind again, next week, inshallah, will be after Maghrib. Uh, because the Isha is getting late, so after Maghrib we'll have it, inshallah, according to the uh, when the sun sets. <laughs>